Mr. President, I uh, kept, uh, couldn't help overhearing my friend from Massachusetts talking about something really good that's going to happen. That is, we're going to lift the caps off of, the, of, uh, of our exports on uh, oil and gas. I, I just can't understand why we ever had caps on exports. You know, it seems like this administration is perfectly willing not just to approve of, but, but to encourage uh, countries like, like uh, Iran and, 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 uh, and, and Russia to export their oil and help there, and yet preclude us from doing the same thing. Right now, one of the problems that we have with Russia is that they have a hand up on us because there are so many countries over there who are dependent upon them to, uh, for their ability to uh, have energy. And uh, it's, it's just pretty, it's pretty amazing that that's going on. So I'm really glad, hopefully this will go through. I know in my state of Oklahoma, it's cost literally hundreds of jobs in just three companies. Uh, because they can no longer uh, afford to to drill here, so that's a that's a big issue. I remember I was I was uh, invited to Lithuania back when the uh, the president of Lithuania wanted to dedicate and open their first terminal, uh, so that they would be able to import uh, gas and oil, and some of that being from us. And that was just everyone's so joyous there, the fact that they're not going to have to rely on Russia any longer. They can rely more on us. So we do have friends out there, but we want to be able to take care of our friends. The past weekend, uh, the officials from the uh, administration traveled 3,800 miles to Paris to attend the international climate negotiations in Paris. Just as a reminder, uh, Mr. President, this is a program that's been going on now for 21 years. Uh, the ones who started this whole idea that the world's coming to an end uh, because of global warming, it came from the United Nations. And, uh, uh, it, and I've gone to several of these meetings. I didn't go to this one because even uh, John Kerry, our Secretary of State, said publicly that there's not going to be anything binding. If there's nothing binding, then why are they even there? In fact, it was kind of interesting because when he made that statement, uh, President Hollande uh, uh, from, uh, from France was outraged. And he said he must have been confused when he said that. But that changed the whole thing. That was just uh, on November 11th, he made that statement. So anyway, that they went ahead and they had their their uh, conference, of, uh, their, their 21st annual meeting that, that they have. I remember one of them I went to, I ran into someone, a friend of mine from a West African country, and I said, uh, Luke, now what are you doing here? Why are you over here? You don't believe all this stuff, do you, on global warming? He said, no. But we stand to be able to bring back literally billions of dollars to Benin, West Africa. And he said, uh, and besides that, this is the biggest party of the year. You know, the worst thing they said at the South America meeting three years ago happened is they ran out of caviar. But anyway, we're paying for all that stuff. And when they went over to say that wonderful things were going to happen in Paris, we knew it wasn't going to happen. Well, the, uh, the, the COP22 conference has nothing to do with saving the environment. And with no means of enforcement, no guarantee of funding, as developed countries had hoped, the deal will not reduce emissions and it will have no impact on global temperatures. So when they say they had this historic meeting, uh, everyone's scratching their heads wondering, what happened? What, uh, did they win anything at all? Even the former NASA scientist, James Hansen was the guy who's credited with being the father of global warming. I can remember when I got involved in the issue, uh, when it came to, they came back from Kyoto and wanted to ratify a, a treaty, uh, James Hansen, that was in 19, uh, the turn of the century, 1998. And James Hansen had been working on global warming. He's a NASA, a NASA scientist for years. It, back, it goes all the way back to the 80s. And he said, he characterized what happened in an in a, uh, interview we had with the British newspaper, The Guardian. He said, the agreement is a fraud. It, here's the guy who's the father of this thing. It's a fraud. He said, it doesn't accomplish anything. And this is likely uh, because the only guaranteed outcome from the Paris Agreement is continued growth in emissions. According to a study, the MIT's uh, joint, it's the MIT Joint Program 
on the science and policy of global change, global emissions will increase by 63% through, that's assuming that they pass, that everyone complies with their commitments, which they obviously they won't and they can't. Uh, global emissions will increase by 63% through 2050 compared to the year 2010. And by the end of this century, the MIT study projects temperatures, if they were successful, would only be reduced by 0.2 degrees Celsius. Even the uh, 26 to 28% uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions, which President Obama committed to uh, on this uh, it, agreement is really a fraud. There's an environmentalist which, uh, witness that came before our committee. He was the Sierra Club's former general counsel. His name was David Bookbinder. He testified before the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, the one that I chair, this year saying that the president's plan, this is the, the, the president's power plan, did, uh, does not add up to 26 to 28% target. It, it's, it's totally unattainable. And when asked to explain the targets and corresponding regulatory actions uh, to Congress, the key administration officials refused to do that. In fact, something happened, maybe the first time this has happened. People wonder how the unelected bureaucracies go off and do things that are not in keeping with the majority of the American people. And we see this all the time. But to preclude that from happening, every bureaucracy has a, a, a committee that is in the Senate and in the House that is supposed to be watching what they're doing and they're, they're supposed to be overseeing. They have jurisdiction. Well, just like my committee has jurisdiction over the EPA. I tried to get them to come in and tell us when it was announced by uh, President Obama that they were gonna uh, propose the 26 to 28% reduction in uh, greenhouse gases by 2025 and they refused to testify. Now, I would ask the chair, in the years that you've been here, have you ever seen a, a, a bureaucracy refuse to come to, before the committee that has the jurisdiction? Well, they did. And uh, where the authority in Congress to approve such uh, expedited, it, it, it has not only not pledged the, uh, the money that has been uh, committed as our price to pay, uh, we, haven't, we haven't actually appropriated any money at all. So. While proclaiming as historic, this agreement did little to overcome the long-standing obstacle that has plagued international climate agreements from the start, where responsibility is unequally divided between the developed and the developing world. I can remember back in about 1999, I guess it was, around the Kyoto time, uh, we had a vote in here, and I was involved in that vote. It was called the Chuck Hagel and Bob Bird vote, and it said, if you come back, from, the, uh, from any of these places that, that, that you, where you're putting this together with a treaty, whether it's Kyoto or another treaty. We will not vote to ratify a treaty that either is bad for the economy of America or doesn't treat China and the developing companies, countries the same as it treats us. Well, that passed 95 to nothing. So when they go over and they come back, it's dead on arrival. And the thing is, everyone knows, except for the 192 countries that were over there. So uh, we can't figure out why they would call this a historic uh, event over there. And while the administration is pushing forward with economically disastrous climate regulations before the end of his presidency, uh, China gets to continue business as usual, including emissions growth through 2030 of uh, uh, each year. That's about 15 uh, for years of increase. So they came back s saying, well, we have to increase our, our uh, 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 CO2 emissions uh, for 15 more years. This morning, I think it's yesterday morning, just three days after uh, India signed off on the final Paris Agreement, The Guardian, that's the big newspaper in, in, um, uh, in London, uh, reported that India is targeting to more than double its output of uh, one and a half billion tons through 2020 because, quote, using them, coal provides the cheapest energy for rapid industrialization that would lift millions out of poverty. The top official from India's coal ministry said, and this is at the, uh, at the historic meeting that they had, said, our, quote, our dependence on coal will continue. There are no other alternatives available. So India is not alone. There are numerous other countries that are gonna be continuing to do that. So um, even though the temperature level 
set is misleading as 1.5 degree cap on global temperatures increasing uh, increase is no more realistic than or technologically feasible than the two degrees that they used before this. The fine print remains the same. For any agreement to have legal significance within the, the United States, it's got to be ratified by the Senate. People in other countries don't know that. They think someone, particularly a very strong uh, president like President Obama, he can just pretty much mandate anything that he wants. It doesn't work that way in the United States. In what was literally the final hour, this is very interesting, they had to delay their announcement of their agreement uh, by two hours because they wanted to make one change in the agreement. And that change was they had language that said developed countries, that's us, United States, developed countries, uh, uh, country parties, shall continue taking the lead by undertaking economy-wide and, and explaining how to do it. They wanted to replace the shall to should because they discovered in their discussions that if they left shall in there, then it would have to come to the United States Senate for ratification. They'd all be embarrassed because we know what the results of that would be. Now, missing from the administration's uh, COP21 celebratory speeches is the fact that neither the American people nor the U.S. Senate supports the international agreement and that the centerpiece regulatory uh, commitment, the, the so-called uh, clean power plan, faces significant legal obstacles in the, uh, in the uh, United States Congress. In fact, not just obstacles, but it's already been voted on. There's a CRA, that's Congr Congressional Review Act, and the Congressional Review Act was saying that we are, uh, are going to reject the uh, clean power plan, and it, it passed with an overwhelming majority of Democrats and Republicans in the House. So it's, uh, what they agreed on has already been rejected. And missing from almost all the Paris Agreement coverage before and after is that the basis for this agreement is not scientific, uh, but uh, uh, not scientific, but political. Ninety percent of the scientists do not believe that the world is coming to an end because of global warming, as in, uh, uh, as environmental NGOs, uh, NGOs and the United States administration officials claim. The Wall Street Journal op-ed examined what constituted the, this misrepresentation of 97%. We always hear, well, there's 97% of the scientists say that this is true, it must be true. Anytime you have something that's unpopular, if you keep saying over and over again, the science is settled, the science is settled, then a lot of people out there believe it is. But when they did the analysis of the 97% consensus and explained it, it was simply based on fractions of respondents. Uh, for example, in a commonly cited uh, 2009 survey of over 3,100 respondents, only 79 were counted because they claimed their expertise was so, uh, solely in the climate related. Uh, well, the 97% consensus then was revealed uh, uh, just a few, a few weeks ago by one of the news stations. Uh, their poll. The senator's said, time has expired. Uh, ask consent, one more minute. Without objection. The poll, which uh, found that 97% uh, of Americans don't care about global warming when stacked against the uh, issues like terrorism, immigration, health care, and the economy. I remember when it used to be the number one uh, concern of Americans, and we, following the same March Gallup poll over the years, it's gone from number one or number two over that period of time to number 15, dead last. So they got a lot of work to do, and it's not going to work. Thank you. Uh, yield the floor. Mr. President. From Connecticut for all of his help last night. We, we worked late, we did the right thing, and I appreciate that very much.